for the sake of time, uh, you'll see a lot of Bible verses bolded on your handout. You're going to want to use those and look them up. For the sake of time, I'm not going to turn to every single one of them. Okay? Um, the, the content of them is in the note that's attached to them, what I think those verses are teaching. But for the sake of time, if I stop and read every single one and flip to all of them, we will be here longer than you want to be. Uh, I would do it, but uh, I know you all probably are tired. So, we're talking about death. And the culture of death, and specifically abortion, euthanasia, and suicide. So, heavy topics, but ones that we have to reckon with. It's all over our Bibles, and it's all over the world, and it is a part of everyone's life at some level. So as Christians, we need to both understand what death is and isn't and have a biblical answer to the problem of death. So the first thing is defining it. What is the biblical data that is given to us as to what death is? Firstly, it is introduced as part of the curse of the fall and is not part of the initially good created order. And so, we'll get into more of this tomorrow when we talk about evil, but if anyone wants to shake their fist at the sky, at God, so to speak, not that God is in the sky, but that's often the phrase used, they don't need to do that. Because death is not part of the initially good created order. Death is judgment and justly earned and deserved. Death is used to depict ultimate separation. As physical death is a separation of soul and body, which as we learned when we talked about the image of God this morning, those two things are supposed to go together. And in the resurrection, they will be rejoined. For those who are in Christ, they are rejoined to a resurrected body that is in the likeness of his resurrected body. And that is part of our great hope that we learn about in especially 1 Corinthians 15, which is referenced multiple times here for that reason. But physical death is, as so many things are in the natural world, representative. Just as marriage pictures an eternal reality, a spiritual truth of the gospel, but is a very physical, in this world, uh, real thing, so too, physical death is a very real thing, but also teaches us something about spiritual death. This separation of soul and body depicts this spiritual death, this separation between us and God. The covenant peace that God had with humanity in the garden is broken, and this breaking is symbolized by physical death. Both physical and spiritual death are a result of God's just judgment on our sin and rebellion. But death is also considered an enemy that God will defeat. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. It is called the last enemy that will be put under the feet of Christ. Death is also a tragedy and brings sorrow to us, right kinds of sorrow. Even to those of us who have the hope of the resurrection, Jesus wept over the death of Lazarus, even though he knew that he was about to summon him out of his tomb. He was weeping over other things that were happening as well around the death of Lazarus, but I think it's fair to say that he was also weeping over the death of his friend. Death's sting is gone for the Christian. Though it is so painful and grievous, we do not grieve as the world does. We grieve as those who have hope in Christ who has conquered the grave. Death for a Christian is tragic, but God has subverted the initial design of death, though it meant judgment in the post-Eden world, the post-fall world. For us, it is the means that God used, that very judgment that he cast upon humanity, he used as the means of victory in Christ. Christ conquered sin through the judgment of death. And so now we are joined to him by faith through a daily dying as he calls us to follow him, 
to deny ourselves and take up a cross to die to our self, our sinful flesh daily, and to follow him instead all the way to the grave itself and back down again. So for the Christian, death is no longer that great painful enemy, but the means that God used to conquer our sin and the means that he uses for most of us, barring the return of Jesus, to bring us to himself. And so where death was once the thing to be most feared because it meant the end of all of your life, all of your conquests, all of your wealth, all of your friendships, all of it vanishing through your hands as you die. For the Christian, it isn't that. It's the start of new life, new beginning, new creation, being brought near to our Savior who died and plowed through the gates of hell and rose from the grave. But, as we see in a place like Proverbs 8.36, all who hate God love death. If death is an enemy of the Christian, then it only makes sense that those who hate God would love God's enemies. And so we have the culture of death that emerges. And this is the culture that we live in. All the other cultural things we've been discussing, like the obsession and worship and glorification of science and rationalism and the create your own identity, be the main character, all of that culminates in a love of death. What the Christian sees as a enemy, as a just judgment, but one that must be overcome for us to be reconciled to God. Those who hate God love death. Love of death is hatred toward God also because it seeks to take justice into one's own hands. In most cases, dealing death out in a faulty attempt to cover one's own wrongs. Or death is sought in order to assault God through those who bear his image. The unjust taking of life claims an authority for oneself that only God has. He alone is the giver and taker of life. Murder is criminalized in scripture precisely for this reason. In Genesis 9-6, for example, where again it says that the reason why murder is wrong is because it destroys an image bearer, God. And so if this culture of death is created by hatred of God, then the only way to end it is for God to change hearts through the proclamation of the gospel, to turn them away from hatred for him and toward love for him instead. So that's our our ultimate solution to any of this, is that God would bless our efforts in the proclamation of the gospel and to turn people away from loving death and hating him to loving him and hating death. And we see this love of death take place in our culture in particular ways. First is murder. There's plenty of it. Always has been. Except for before the fall. And you shall not murder is not against just killing. Uh, Sorry, this command is not against just killing in a just war or in self-defense. The Bible gives permission for this. But it is against, the command is prohibiting unjustified killing. The, the kind that arises in Cain's heart as he envies and covets what is the relationship his brother has with God and he strikes him down. And this kind of unjustified killing that God hates and prohibits in his law word arises in our culture in these chief ways where it has been decriminalized, where our governments have made unjust decisions, whether it's in our country or in our state or in other countries all across the world, these different kinds of murder have been approved of, applauded, celebrated. Abortion is one of them. There is no scenario in which abortion is morally justifiable. 
There are scenarios in which a person may murder their baby out of coercion, out of threatenings, out of ignorance. And toward those situations, we as Christians must show great sympathy and compassion and mercy. It does not mean that the act was right, but we should, again, sympathize with those people. We should not hit them over the head with a heavy hammer. As often they know that what they did was wrong, but they felt like they had no other option. So we should offer them those things. We should give them other possibilities to save the life of the child. But the ultimate thing that we must bring to those who have done this is the gospel. The grace and mercy of God toward sinners of all kinds. Again, we must show sympathy and compassion. I've been to the, one of the only remaining abortion mills in Georgia. And you see various kinds of people there who are going in to kill their children. There were some who said, I've, I've had many. I've had more. I love doing this and I will do it again. And by some, I mean there was one. The great majority were clearly ashamed. Clearly did not want to be there. Some of them that we did get to speak to were heartbroken. But again, they felt like they could do nothing else. And so, for the one who's cackling like an evil villain over killing her child, okay, should we show her compassion? Yes. Is it the same kind that we show to the other one? Is it it's in a different way? We show her compassion through sharing the gospel with her, through pleading with her to repent of this very clear wickedness that she loves and enjoys. But to the one who knows what she's done is wrong already, we don't need to beat her over the head with the fact that what she's, what she's done is wrong. Rather, we should show her that God ha can have and will through Christ, have mercy upon her. Did you hold the men who are involved to account, whether it's the doctors or the fathers, in cases in which they are the ones who are coercing or threatening, but abortion is never justified. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Euthanasia. What is euthanasia? It's medically induced suicide. So it's just a different kind of suicide, but this one is the one that's culturally acceptable. Uh, sometimes they'll call it death with dignity. And there are some countries, I believe I heard recently, a 28-year-old, I think in the Netherlands, is getting euthanized voluntarily because she's just depressed. She, all right. Now, suicide is the next one. And, and, and so it's like, well, what's the difference? She's doing the same thing. Well, this one is government-funded <laughs> and permissible, according to the government. Uh, in, in her country at least, and I believe Canada has a lot of permissible euthanasia now. But we are never given moral permission to actively end someone's life because they just ask us to. That is nowhere in Scripture. There is no dignity in death. If we have a biblical understanding of death, death is judgment and curse. There's no dying with dignity. Death is brutal. And tragic. And part of the curse that God has placed upon us because of the fall. In many ways, it's the ultimate expression of that curse. And yet there are those who see it, again, as their only way out. And to the people contemplating such actions, we should again show great sympathy and compassion for them. I myself, for a long time, before and after I was a Christian, struggled greatly with wanting to kill myself. Because I was depressed. And it was hard to talk about that with people. And so if someone ever comes to you and expresses that to you, don't freak out. Don't be shocked. Don't go, ah, I don't want to talk to you anymore because you're kind of crazy. Don't do that. Show them compassion. Show them sympathy. Pray with them. Pray for them. Tell someone, tell an adult, uh, in their life, who can help them, one who will help them.
But what euthanasia represents in our culture is again this celebration of death as something to be in, enjoyed and to volunteer for. And we have to push back against that. Because the same people who think euthanasia is okay think that suicide on your own is wrong. So what's the deal with that? Well, if we are never given moral permission to actively end someone else's life because they ask us to, then we certainly cannot end our own because we ask ourselves to, because we just want to. We are not permitted to do this on a moral level. Now, there's some, and chiefly this idea comes from Roman Catholicism, who will say that if you kill yourself, you're going straight to hell no matter what. Okay? I'm going to push back against that idea. Really good illustration I heard from a pastor one time about this is that if, if the last thing that you do right before you die is sin, are you going to hell? That's the way that you have to frame this question. The reason why in Roman Catholicism, suicide sends you straight to hell is because they have degrees, different categories of sins. They have mortal sins and venial sins. And murder is a mortal sin. Mortal sins strip you of your salvation when you commit them. And you got to go get it back. Well, if you kill yourself, you can't do that, can you? So that's why in Roman Catholicism, a mortal sin, uh, suicide is a mortal sin and sends you straight off to hell. But we're not Roman Catholic, praise God. And if the last thing that I do right before I die is a sin, even a grievous one. The illustration I've heard before is someone got into an argument with his wife. And he said horrible, hurtful things to her. And then in, in an angry fit, got into his car and drove out on the street on a rainy night, slip and slide, straight into a pole, head on, dies. Is he going to hell? I don't think there's any biblical warrant to say so. What that doesn't mean is you can go kill yourself, okay? <laughs> Just because I'm saying, hey, you're not going to go that straight, you probably aren't going to go straight away to hell if you kill yourself, don't, doesn't mean I'm encouraging it. Right now, I'm curious. That is a very good question. I'm I curious now. What are you curious about? What he just said. Uh, say, say it again. I know, but before that. Okay, so there are some. Christian circles and traditions that teach that suicide would send you to hell no matter what, no matter what your previous life had been like. And I'm making the case that it's not true because what we would be saying there is that God's grace in your life would suddenly end just on that sin and not on others. So if the last act you took was sinful before you died, we would be saying that this is a unique one. So we would be making the same case with the Roman Catholics. We would be putting suicide in its own individual category that, hey, you know, you did this thing, maybe in an act of deep depression or even drug addledness, if someone had given you a bunch of crazy pills, like, it, if, the last is, if the last thing you do was sinful, then you're going to hell. And I don't think that's true. So that's the case I'm making. But what if, what, another way of saying it is, it would say Jesus is not enough. He was going to take care of Yeah. Um, and, and again, you probably know people, or maybe you yourself have struggled with suicidal thoughts, different things. Like, man, it would just be better if I just I could stop being alive. Please, 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 come talk to somebody. Me, Harry, Jessica, whoever your parents. If your parents are trustworthy people, I know that some people have parents who aren't trustworthy in that way. Um, and, and might hurt them more than they were planning to hurt themselves as a result of such statements. I'm not saying that about anyone in particular in here. Just it's being recorded, so I gotta cover my bases. Um, but talk to a Christian adult that you trust and tell them there is help, there is hope 
again in the gospel, in scripture, from the people of God. And you don't always have to feel that way. Again, our feelings are mutable. They're changeable. God is not just changing us in our behavior, but also in the way we think and the way we feel. And conforming us to the image of Christ in every area of our image bearing. So, for example, myself, I don't struggle with those things anymore. And I'm thankful to God for that. But there is no special trick. There's no magic potion. There we go. Uh, there's no just... Oh, well, magic potion is a good clarify, clarifying statement for that. Because sometimes that's what you get if you go to secular sources. They give you a drug cocktail and go, here, this will make you feel better. That doesn't always work. Sometimes it makes it worse. Sometimes it makes people more suicidal. The solution to such feelings and temptations to act is in the gospel. Give you hope and to give you God's clear command. You're not, you're not allowed to murder yourself. God says no. That should be enough. But often what suicide can be an expression of is a means. For me, this is what it was. I was tempted toward it because I wanted to atone for my sin. I was trapped in besetting sin that I just kept doing over and over and over and over and over. And I felt like I couldn't get out. Even after I became a Christian, I couldn't get out, couldn't get out. I'd be good for a while, couldn't get out. I just felt guilty all the time. And part of my problem was that I refused to take very concrete steps to repent, like telling someone else about my sin. And the other problem was that I had expectations of myself that were not what God expected of me. And the other problem was that I wanted, I thought that if I could just spill my own blood, then I could sort it out. Maybe God would forgive me then if I just punished myself, since he, he wouldn't do it. He refused to make my life as miserable, as miserable as I wanted it to be. And so I wanted to sacrifice myself for my own sin. And when I wanted that, I wasn't believing in the sacrifice of Jesus. That his sacrifice was enough. That his death was enough for me. That he could, that he, actually, his death was for my death. That I deserved. And he took my place. So, how do we engage? Briefly. Engaging with abortion. I've already talked some about engaging, but let me walk you through some arguments because often these result, talks about this result in arguments. Let me walk you through the positions that can be taken and, and some helpful things for you. The internal critique of the pro-abortion view uh, is what a guy named Scott Klusendorf, he's a Christian apologist who focuses on this issue often. He calls it SLED. It's an acronym. It helps you remember good questions to ask those who defend abortion and it Again, it's an internal critique. So an internal critique of another position is when you step into their worldview and ask hard questions about it. Because remember, every worldview but the Christian one is built on sand. So if you become that raging storm <laughs> that blows against the wall, it will crumble eventually. Don't be raging. I mean, I need to get my metaphors right. <laughs> uh, maybe I should write them down. Um, but, but if, if you are able to do that, then you can show them from the inside of their own position that it's incoherent. And so some of the questions you can ask will force them to face the reality. Their position also grants them permission to kill a child outside the womb just as much as they want to kill the child inside the womb. So here's the sled thing. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. These are the four things that you ask them Say, okay, what's the difference between me outside of my mother's womb and the baby inside of her mother's womb right now? Those four things are different. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Those are the differences. Both are human. And even pro-abortion science admits this in many places now. So that's not the issue. The issue is, they think that if someone's smaller than you, if someone's brain is less, less developed than yours or body is less developed than yours, if they're in a different environment inside the womb versus outside the womb, 
And if they're dependent upon the mother and can't live on their own, then you can kill them. But imagine for a moment a child outside the womb. Is there a difference between him and the one inside? He's smaller than you. His level of development is far less than yours still. His skull's still kind of squishy. That's why you have to be careful. His environment is now the same as yours, mostly. So maybe that, you know, that one has a little bit different. His level of dependency, is he independent of his mother now? No. He still needs somebody to take care of him. <laughs> um, someone's got to take care of this kid. So the only difference is now the environment. And so they have to argue that that, is, that justifies murder. I can kill someone who's smaller than me, who is less developed than me, and who is dependent on someone else simply because there is the barrier of a mother's womb between them and the outside world. Which means that, can I kill someone on a different planet? Can I kill someone who's in a building versus out? If environment is the only thing that changes anything, then, man, we can switch up some environments and start murdering all kinds of people if we want to. And you can show that that is an incoherent position. Now, it doesn't provide a solution, ultimately. That's the gospel. The gospel comes in as you say, hey, that incoherency, I can give you a coherent worldview about life and meaning and murder and why it's wrong, all of that. I've got that. I'm a Christian. Here, let me show you how that works from the gospel up. But internal critiques are helpful because it can silence the arguments that come against the gospel and Christianity. Objections you might hear. What about ectopic pregnancies? These are ones where all the wires get crossed inside the womb, baby's in the wrong place, mother's life is in danger. That's, that's the ba basic premise. Baby's in danger, mom is in danger. That's always what they mean by this. There's two answers. One is that someone, one person's life being in danger doesn't mean that you should expedite the process and kill them to make things better. Okay? That's <laughs> not how that works. Now, now they're just saying euthanize the baby. Well, euthanasia is wrong too. One person's life being in danger, another person's life being in danger is a triage situation. People face this all the time in battlefield situations, in medical situations. We have so much energy, supplies, and ability, and we can only save so many people, we have to make decisions. That's not a good place to be. You don't want to be there. But what you don't do is actively go and murder the people who you can't save. You don't walk through the emergency room and go, well, we're not going to have time to get to you, so here, let me just stab. You don't do that. You try, you try to save everybody. You try to save everyone you can, right? Of course. Most people would agree with this. So, in the situation of an ectopic pregnancy, you would try to save both mother and child if possible. That's what you would do. And saving as many people as you can in the situation, if someone doesn't make it, as long as you weren't killing them actively, that is not the same thing as an abortion. An abortion is an active killing of the child. Murder. Trying to save everybody and people don't make it on the operating table is not the same thing. It's tragic. It's horrific. We don't want that situation. But the solution is not kill someone so we just don't have to worry about it. What about a difficult financial situation? Well, I can't afford to feed the kid. I can't, I can't, I, I'm, I'm, I got too many, or I've got, I don't have a job. What am I going to do? Well, do you get to murder people because you're poor? No. <laughs> no. And again, there's a differentiation of definitions happening. When these objections are brought up, the assumption is abortion is not murder. Once you get there, these begin to fall away.
but you've got to get there. That's what the internal critique before is for. If you don't think it's okay to kill somebody because of a difference of size, development, environment, and dependency, then you shouldn't think it's okay to kill someone because you have a difficult financial situation. And then if you're in a position to offer to help this person, you should. Like, okay, I hear you. Keep your baby, let me help you. Or I can call some people who can. What about cases of rape? Horrible tragedies, indeed, weren't the death penalty in Scripture. Because it was considered equivalent with taking someone's life. Raping someone was murdering them in allegory. That's how awful it is. So what about those? What about a child conceived by that means? Do we murder someone because someone else did something awful? No. No. We don't multiply sins to someone else's sin. It's often what happens. Again, compassion, sympathy, gospel. In these situations, they're difficult. We don't want to minimize that. But it only makes things worse and not better if we murder people when we're in difficult situations. What if I don't want to raise a child? Now this one is where we start to get the territory of this is less of a difficult situation and you've got main character syndrome and, and we, we need to have a, come, a, come to, a different kind of come to Jesus moment. All right, well, we'll take your child. Or this Christian adoption agency will take your child. Or grow up. You're a parent now. I'm happy for you. What if the father has left me alone? Again, I'm sorry. Tragic. That doesn't mean you get to murder your kid. So again, compassion, sympathy for those who are in difficult situations. They have to have it. It's very important. We don't want to try to beat them over the head with facts and logic. Okay? But sometimes some facts and logic need to be brought to bear in difficult situations to try to help people see out of their emotions. But we have to do that with care and giving them hope along the way and help as well. One of the main critiques of those who are against abortion is often, well, y'all only care about the baby while the baby's in the womb. You don't care about him afterwards. Well, it's largely actually not true, but in certain cases, yeah, people are politically minded and not gospel minded about this. So, like, no, yeah, we'll, we'll help you. We know people. We'll, we'll rally. Just don't kill your kid. Now, engaging with euthanasia and suicide. The despair that often leads one to contemplate suicide is not something to be taken lightly. The Bible is familiar with it. Elijah wants to die when the land is controlled by wicked rulers seeking his life because of his prophetic ministry. David groans in the weight of his sin and despair in the Psalms. There is hope in Jesus Christ for the chief of sinners and for those who feel trapped in sorrow and despair because Jesus understands it. He's not distant. God is not up away in the heavens and not understanding of your sorrow because Jesus is called a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, verse 3. I will read these to you to close. He, this is referring to Jesus, was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Then verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So he did not just carry our sins, but also our griefs and sorrows with him. 
But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. And not simply in eternity, but even now, the hope that that offers to you, because of the eternal hope it offers for you, can heal the wounds of the present. And can bring joy out of sorrow. Hebrews 4.15. Verse that <clears throat> ought to be near and dear, I think, to everyone. Every Christian. And if you're not familiar with it, well, here you go. Welcome to one of the greatest truths in Scripture. For we do not have a high priest, that being Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of who Jesus is, as our sympathetic high priest, the one who understands us, not just abstractly, but experientially, though without sin. He is the one that we, we, can, we, can, we can go to Him. Like I was saying earlier, you know, my problem with my sin was that I wasn't taking it to Jesus. I was trying to solve it myself. My guilt, my shame was driving me to want to, I'm going to fix this myself. And my fix was death. But that's not God's solution for sin. At least not your death. It's Jesus' death. So you can go to him, he who died and has risen and conquered the grave, to deal with your own shame and sorrow and sin. 